thank you all so much for joining us today. I'm really grateful for folks who have been coming to these uh, this series of webinars. We have a really awesome, again, session today. Um, so welcome to Writing Through Lived Experience, Writing to Support Your Mental Health Journey. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Kelly Davis. I'm the Director of Peer Advocacy, Supports, and Services in the National Office of Mental Health America. I'm here today with some folks from our awesome affiliate in Connecticut. It looks like we have some Connecticut folks um, checking in in the chat, so welcome. I'm here to talk about writing and mental health. Um, and just to, as a heads up, um, I'll be monitoring the chat box. So if you have any technical difficulties or anything, feel free to put those in there. Um, and I'll be able to help you during the course of the next 60 minutes for the webinar. Um, additionally, if you have any questions, feel free to drop those in. And we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A at the end of the session. Um, the webinar is being recorded. And the webinar and the recording will be available on MHA's website next week. Um, but we'll also be sending out to everybody who registered um, the recording and the slides as well. Um, before I introduce our presenters, and they're also going to tell you about some awesome upcoming events and resources through Mental Health Connecticut, I um, just wanted to do a quick plug for MHA as well. Um, as I'm sure everyone knows, uh, next month is Mental Health Month, um, coming up very quickly. And MAJ actually founded Mental Health Month in 1949. Um, this month, our theme is Tools to Thrive. And we have a really awesome um, toolkit with a lot of different resources, including, um, I think, one that will be somewhat similar to what we're doing today um, called Owning Your Feelings. So if you haven't had a chance, um, please head to MAJ's website and download our um, 2020 Mental Health Month toolkit. I'll drop that link in the chat as well. Um, but without further ado, I will introduce our presenters and then um, hand it over and they can get started. Um, so our presenters today are Janet Reynolds and Susie Craig. Janet Reynolds is an award-winning writer and editor and former high school English teacher. She created Write On, a writing program with Mental Health Connecticut designed to help young adults with mental health issues and their recovery journey. As a seasoned editor and marketer, who understands how to tell a story and how to get that story out to the world, she is currently writing a memoir about her family's journey with schizophrenia. Reynolds holds a master's in English, liter English literature from Trinity College and lives in Canton, Connecticut with her family. Susie Craig is the Chief Strategy Officer for Mental Health Connecticut. She brings more than 20 years of strategic planning, program design, marketing and development, communications, and community engagement at and community engagement expertise to MHC. Her ability to cultivate trusted, mutually beneficial relationships has resulted in a long track record of wins at MHC and her previous positions in book publishing, strategic brand consulting, public broadcasting, and Connecticut's startup ecosystem and more. Susie is a graduate of the University of Connecticut and a nationally certified yoga teacher. She lives in West Hartford, Connecticut with her family. And with that, I will turn it over to the two of you. All right, thank you, Kelly. Um, thank you so much for that intro and welcome everyone. Jenna and I are really excited to be here. Um, and just a shout out back to MHA for all of the great work you've been doing in the past couple of months uh, with the resources and, and these amazing webinars. And um, we're really excited to have this opportunity to share uh, a bit about what we have, oh boy, technical difficulties. I'm looking to shift my slides. Do I have control, Kelly? Yes. But it looks like oh. maybe you, there you go. <laughs> oh, I jumped the gun. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so just thank you, MHA, for this. We're, we're really excited to, to share what's happening in, in Connecticut. Um, and so the, for the remaining hour, we really have broken this up into two different parts. The first part is sharing the power of writing, the impact of writing, um, and what that does on the brain, and also what we've learned through our Write On program, which is a program um, that Janet and I will both tell you a little bit more about, is one that was created by Janet, and she brought it to MHC. And I have the good fortune of working behind the scenes to, um, to give the program what it needs so that we can um, help it grow, and our goal with it is to build it into an evidence-based evidence practice, which is 
um, where it's very much along its way where it's going, which is really exciting. So we're going to talk about uh, the brain on writing and, and um, what we've learned through Write On. And then I'm going to kick it back to Janet, who will um, help you develop your writing practice and help you get, um, get going on benefiting um, from the amazing practice of writing for, for your own help. All right, so let's get started. And I'm going to send it over to Jenna. She's going to start us off, and then she'll send it back to me. Yes. Yeah. You, you can go to the next slide, though. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody um, for joining us today or listening to the recording um, at another point. And uh, to reiterate Susie's point about thanking uh, Mental Health America for giving us the chance to talk about uh, writing and how it can help you. Uh, in your daily life. Um, this, uh, and I also just want to say one other thing, which is that this, this uh, webinar is, it can be helpful both for mental health professionals, but it's also um, helpful, frankly, for just about anybody, I think, who is looking for ways to um, have writing enter their lives, um, expand on writing they're already doing, or also just use it as another tool for exploring and self-discovery. Um, so this is one of my favorite quotes, and it sort of explains my life to a T. Flannery O'Connor is a Southern writer, um, and she, she wrote, I write because I don't know what I think until I read what I say. And this is basically like welcome to my life. Um, I am a lifelong journaler. Uh, I got my first diary when I was in second grade, and I still have it, um, and it's fascinating reading <laughs> when I want a good laugh to go back and sort of see, you know, what I thought was a pressing thing to put down in my diary, um, which of course locked. Um, and But it started me off on a lifetime of journals. I have many, many journals, probably 20 at this point, and I, ha I haven't necessarily journaled every day, but I've done it consistently throughout my life. And um, I find it as to be a very useful tool for sort of trying to figure out what I'm doing or what I'm thinking or um, let go of certain feelings that I may um, be having ar around things. Um, I uh, was, I've always written, but I jumped into it really, really hard um, when our one of our children just de developed schizophrenia. And um, it was a very, very challenging time, as I'm sure you can imagine. And um, I, I began, once we were done with sort of the immediate crises, I began writing and writing my way into trying to understand what is essentially um, an, an event and an experience that is not understandable really on many, many levels. But I wrote as a way to release my pain. I wrote as a way to release my anger. I wrote as a way to try to understand like a journey that is not linear in any way. Um, and to also understand better ways to um, integrate this as part of our lives um, with my son, but also with our family. And at one point during this journey, I um, asked my son if he would like to do some writing around this, and he did. And so he he we were writing together around this, and it was informative for me as well because I learned more about what he was thinking or his experience um, because he shared his story with me. And he also um, uh, told me how much it helped him. And so it was sort of, as I was literally experiencing this, and also, you know, I've been a, a writer my whole life, a journalist, and I was a high school English teacher, and et cetera, et cetera, I realized how much writing has help, helped both of us on this journey. And so I had this idea about creating Write On and um, using writing as part of a recovery tool for people at, you know, at whatever point they are in their day, in their life, in their mental health journey. And so that's sort of how that got going. And now, yes, Susie, you read my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Magic. Um, so part of what gets me interested is I think everyone tells stories about themselves. You know, we have stories that um, 
we then use these stories to sort of build our own perception of ourselves and also it affects our behaviors and how we're how we move forward based on these stories right and so you know if you have a dinner table um, event right and there are five people around the dinner table and ten years later you ask each of those five people to write down what happened you're gonna get five different stories there may be some things around it that are sort of the same. Yes, we all ate meatloaf, although it may not even all be that everybody remembers they ate meatloaf, right? Um, and it's the stories that we tell ourselves that help to inform our own behaviors. And I think this can be especially challenging as well for people who have mental health um, challenges or issues because they get told certain things almost as soon as you get a diagnosis suddenly then that's a story that you start to tell yourself about what your options are, what your behaviors are, what your behaviors may be, what your future may hold. And it, it starts to become a story that can affect your movement forward or not, right? Um, they become facts. I mean, I'll take the example of schizophrenia, right? You know, schizophrenia. I mean, almost any time there's a, a shooting, the first thing that comes out in the media is like, well, was the person schizophrenic? The assumption is that all schizophrenics are violent, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They're all going to act out. And one of the things that I think is critical around storytelling and how writing can help people is to try to determine what the real story is and it's also an opportunity to rewrite stories, right? You can rewrite the ending. You can rewrite what's going on. You can rewrite your understanding of something. And that can enable you to have a kind of healing and, and, a, and a, a development that enables you to move forward in some ways. You can decide or see what's true and what's not and then move from there. Um, and I'm going to give an example from my life. Um, I'm going to tell you a story. So... Uh, that's you may wonder why there are two photos of me one of them is when I'm younger and one is more recent and um, when I was a child I was in elementary school and um, I was the tallest person in my school uh, until sixth grade when another a, a boy caught up to me so we were the two tallest people in our school and um, I was also a chubby child and every year, the way my school operated, um, we would all march down to the nurse's office once a year to get our height and weight told, or, you know, for our records. And typically, you know, the teacher um, would sit down at a desk and she would be recording your height and weight and the nurse, you would stand on the scale and she'd do your height and then she'd do your weight. And when I was in fifth grade, um, I always hated this day because I was always it was always just made clear that I was the tallest, but also, you know, I was heavier. So I went to, so we walked down the hall, um, I stand on the scale, and, and the nurse, and the teacher, instead of saying, um, saying out loud my height and weight, she whispers it to the nurse. Now, of course, all the kids immediately picked up on this, and at that moment, you know, kids being who they are, um, I developed a nickname from somebody, I don't remember who, but anyway, my nickname became Janet the Planet. But more importantly, at that moment in my life, I became fat in my head. Um, from that point on, I regarded myself as heavy and, and fat. And I have to say my parents were super, um, they never said boo about what I ate. And when I look back on photos of myself, I'm just like, yeah, well, I was chubby, but I was also 5'2 at this point. So, of course, I weighed more than 100 pounds, right? At any rate, but I became fat in my head. And this is behavior that... Um, has affected me for decades. You know, it affected, I w went through periods in my life where I weighed myself every day, and if I gained a pound, I felt negatively about myself. It affected sort of how I thought about food, and, you know, was this good food? Was this bad food? Did I deserve this kind of food? It affected sort of how, um, the kinds of risks that I took, because I, you know, saw myself as somebody who perhaps wasn't able to do certain things. Um, it, you know, it just it was very sort of uh, what I'm going to call very negative behavior on a lot of levels, especially when I look back on photos of myself at various points in my life and I think, wow, I wasn't fat. Um, but after a lot of sort of therapy and sort of thinking it through and writing, um, I realized I don't have to hold on to that story anymore. 
I don't have to regard myself that way. That is a story that I told myself based on one incident in fifth grade and some kid who yelled out, oh, it's Janet the Planet. And so I realized that story is not a story I need to tell or believe. And so we moved on now, and that's an example of how you can work on your stories and how, how um, life-affirming that process can be. Susie? All right. Thank you, Janet. So uh, we're going to shift into geeking out on some data and a bit of research, and then we'll get into the practice of writing. So I've got a couple of slides here. Um, one is <clears throat> there's a link at the bottom, which we can be sure, and I know the slides will be going out after, after the webinar. Um, but something to check out later is how writing impacts the brain. And the next slide, I'll just go back and forth here a little bit. The next one is specifically tailored to storytelling. Um, and um, I'll come back to that in a second. But um, the act of writing, so your act of writing, your solo act of, of writing, journaling, um, you know, getting those thoughts down on paper or your laptop or whatever that looks like, um, what that does to your brain. And then the storytelling piece is really interesting, too, if you think about um, the stories you tell yourself, just like Janet was, was talking about. So um, the act of writing is um, an amazing therapeutic tool, right? Um, taking part in, in writing exercises, writing in a stream of conscious way, right? So not editing yourself, but just continuing to write is very helpful in reducing stress. It can be a wonderful coping mechanism. Um, and <clears throat> It's, you know, it's just something to know that it actually um, transforms um, in your brain. It transforms, you know, um, the way your brain actually um, engages with your healing process. It, it releases dopamine. It does all these amazing things. Um, so I know, I'm sure many of you are already journal and you take part in writing but if you don't it's just um, it's a really good thing to know that you're doing if you take the time to do this you're doing more than just um, you know putting something down on paper even if it, you don't do anything with it or it doesn't go anywhere it's still doing amazing things for your health and this is really interesting and I won't spend too much time here but again something to dig into after if you really want to know um, the impact of, of storytelling and how it impacts the um, brain. So these, these data points are kind of um, designed to share how when you're hearing a story, what that does um, to your brain. But again, think about this in the context of um, you telling your own stories and um, what this can do and how it can be powerful. So a couple of points here. Really interesting. Neural coupling and um, mirroring. mirroring are about your experience um, and the engagement to the speaker, which could be you or someone else, and also to the story. So neural coupling is really interesting. Um, when you hear a story, as opposed to, you know, fast statistics, data, when you hear a story, when it's coming, you know, into your brain, um, it actually creates empathy. So you start to think that someone else's story is um, your own ideas and experiences. Um, <clears throat> and so this could be good and bad, right? But either way, there's some form of empathy that's created when a story is coming in. Um, <clears throat> mirroring as well is you start to kind of put yourself in, in the shoes of someone else. So, um, you know, that experience experience um, is related to, you know, the story and the, the speaker as well. So dopamine is released um, when you're hearing stories, right? When you have an emotionally charged quote unquote event, which then makes it easier to remember, remember and then with greater accuracy a story. That's why we remember stories more than we do data and facts, not that data and statistics and and numbers are important. It's just when you hear a story, um, when you're experiencing a story, it releases dopamine, which is great. And then also you remember that story for longer. It sticks with you. 
Um, and then cortex activity, really interesting. Again, when you're processing facts, there's only two areas of the brain that are activated. But when you're hearing a story, there's a lot being fired up, a lot going on. So just something to consider and some interesting things to, to understand around how this impacts and why storytelling and writing is so powerful. So um, before we get into the actual practice of writing and writing tips from Janet, I wanted to share some um, really interesting things that we've learned from our Write On program. So as Janet mentioned, she brought this program to us. And we said, of course, we will create this and make this happen. This is amazing. And so the program is designed um, to be an eight uh, to nine week um, class. Um, and formally in person. Now it's, you know, it's a bit virtual and we're trying to figure that out. Um, but the students come into the class and they learn all sorts of things um, around how to use writing as a healing mechanism and, and how to just develop that practice. Um, but um, along with the actual class, what we found is that community that is built among the writers and the environment that Janet is so uh, amazing to create is it really sets the stage um, for individuals to be in a space, so a head space and an actual physical space where they can really feel comfortable um, sharing their own pace and their own time, um, their story, and um, things that are on their mind, heavy things that they've been carrying around for a long time. So the environment that we create in the Write On program, we found amazingly beneficial to accelerate the recovery process. So I have this slide up. It's, you know, kind of a weird little uh, context better, I like to think of it. Um, but what we found <clears throat> that happens during the course of the Write On program is um, the individuals are, are coming in and they're carrying around, you know, their trauma, their experiences, their diagnoses, um, a lot of, of, of things that, um, that, you know, they're living with day to day. And then in the moment, we're bringing them through this experience, and through that experience, they're transforming. It's a, it's a transformative process. So they're moving, you know, in that moment, and they're leaving the stuff behind. You know, they're leaving the bags and things that they don't need anymore behind, and it's bringing them, you know, towards the future into a new place where they can move forward. Um, and it truly is accelerating um, their recovery process. And so we wanted to make sure, um, even though we knew this program was amazing and effective and, and impactful, um, but we partnered with the University of Hartford Center for Social Research to research the program. And we found out actually, you know, uh, one thing that I wouldn't say was surprising, but it put a really fine point onto what was happening during Write On, and that's that um, the intervention of the program was really targeting self-stigma. So, interesting term, right? Some of you may have heard this, some of you may have not. What is self-stigma? Well, self-stigma, you can put a big equal sign between that and shame, right? So, living with mental health conditions, you know, going through the recovery process, shame can be um, almost like a, it can almost hijack your, your recovery process. It can prevent you from moving forward. Um, it can keep you in, in a very negative place. Um, it can prevent you from getting help. It can prevent you um, from moving on and, and um, recovering and healing other parts of your life. But what right in has done to the experience is that it helps to break that negative chain of events. It has caused, you know, um, amazing things. And, and for each individual, it's a totally different experience because um, we're always meeting them where they're at. But using um, writing and the community that we've built um, and the class, which ends in a live um, storytelling event, which is then recorded into podcasts, and that whole entire experience, soup to nuts, um, we found is really accelerating the recovery process, which is pretty amazing. Um, students have, you know, a new understanding of who they are. They have confidence. Um, about talking about their mental health conditions. For some at those live storytelling events, it's the first time they're sharing 
um, their personal journey in, in their way to their parents and their families and their loved ones. Um, and overall, they said that they're able to get in a space where they're able to write without judgment, um, where they're able to, you know, really take on their mental health journey in a way that they hadn't before, which is pretty exciting. And here's just a little story. Oops, I can move. I feel like I'm hitting the arrow button like multiple times, and then it jumps. Yeah, there we go. Um, so Lauren uh, is uh, one of our alumni now. She went through the program. And um, it was a really transformative experience uh, for her. And um, all of our podcasts and all of our stories about Right On, you can see um, linked from the, the web um, the web address at the bottom of the screen. Also, the full research report, if you really want to geek out on the data, is also posted there. Really interesting about Lauren is that um, while she was taking the class, at some point she was also hospitalized. She took a, a, a big dip in her recovery. And then she came back. Um, she came back and she completed the course and she got up and told her um, amazing, powerful story. And it was a story about um, her and her dad who at the time um, they hadn't been speaking and they were, they were not talking and they did not have a relationship. Um, and then after this experience, she reengaged with her dad and now they're, you know, they have a relationship and there's so many other amazing things that she's been able to take on since. So, so that's enough about us and our program, really just sharing so that, you know, you can really see like the power of writing and the power of, of storytelling and what this can do for you. Um, and I'm going to kick it over to Janet right now. I'm going to end you with this quote. I really love this. One of our write-up participants said, now I'm ready to let the truth fly, which I think is, is really, really an awesome spot to leave you all on, and as you can then start your journey of letting the truth fly, I'm going to kick it over to you, Janet. Okay, great. Uh, I, I do want to... Okay, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, because I'm getting some weird echo. All right. At any rate, um, I do just want to say one last thing about... Uh, Lauren's story, and I would encourage you to go to the website and listen to some of the Telling Tales um, uh, recordings of various people's um, works um, to get a feel for sort of some of what people have done just through writing itself. Uh, but one of the things that she was struggling with was that um, her, her father had bipolar and at the same time that she was dealing with it. So it's a very personal story, and I... It's very strong. She said it to music, and I just want to pass that on. So, so what I'm going to talk about now is I'm going to talk about sort of setting up and maintaining a writing practice um, for for people. Um, uh, Susie, can you change the slide? Um, so, um, so one of the things that I think is fascinating about writing is that people um, assume you can only start writing if you're already a good writer which of course when you think about it is kind of an absurd concept, right? I mean, if you decide that you want to run a 5K, you don't go out and be like, go to do the race the next day. I mean, you might if you're, you know, like 20 or something and, you know, super fit and the ramifications wouldn't be much. But for most people, they are like, oh, I'm going to run a 5K. I'm going to practice. I'm going to build up to running that length of time. I'm going to have certain expectations about how, how my first 5K race might go. And maybe my seventh 5K race will be even better, you know. So we have these. But for writing, for some reason, people sort of like, I can't do that because I'm not good at it. But, you, but the point is, part of what you have to do is practice, right? Writing is a muscle. And I'm going to share a story about myself, you know, I've been writing my whole life, and when I was a reporter, a young, a younger reporter, um, uh, you know, I, my editors were like, well, you've got to improve in certain areas of how you write, and I'm like, all right, what do I have to do? And so I was a big fan of participial phrases, which are the ones that have, have like, starting today, like, ING words, right, and a comma, and then moving on. And one of my editors said, you know, you overuse that. Like, you just overuse that, right? 
And so what I did, and then there were some other examples too, like, you know, don't use the there is or there are construction. You know, don't start a sentence with there is or there are. If you can avoid it, you can always do write a much better sentence if you have a noun and a verb as your starter. And there are almost always ways to rewrite a there is, there are sentence. However, what I would do and I would, is I had a, would put a post-it up in front of my computer at work on the wall in front of me and it had one thing on it. It would be very sentence structure. And I would do my writing and my reporting and I my piece and when it was time for, before it was time to turn in the story, I would sit down and I would literally look through the piece and think about very sentence structure. Right? I would go through it thinking about that or don't overuse participial phrases or avoid there is, there are constructions. And, but I literally had one post-it note at a time. And when I felt like that was ingrained in my brain in terms of how I was writing, I'd take that post-it note down and I'd put up another one. So my point is I did a lot of practicing. Um, and so it's important just to keep in mind writing is a, is a muscle. You have to you have to work it in order to get better at it or to get to a place where you feel more comfortable about it, right? The writing that you're doing is writing for you. I mean, yes, maybe your intent as a listener here is to sort of write the next great American novel, in which case, you know, go you, right? But your intent may also just be like, I just want to write more. I feel good when I do this or I want to explore this. I want to see where this takes me. And if those are all very, very good and realistic um, goals, right? So thinking about it like that and think about it as writing is a muscle. So in order to get a practice going, um, you have to make a realistic commitment. Now, you could say, um, and I say this to my students when I'm teaching a class, um, I'm going to write an hour a day, seven days a week, right? Well, I mean, that may be sort of lofty goal. That may be the goal you think the teacher wants to hear. But what's going to happen? You know, two days into it, you're going to fail because it's unrealistic. It's too much time. It's too much frequency. It's et cetera, you know, et cetera. It's much better to do something like, I'm going to write five minutes a day, three times a week. And you know what's going to happen? You're going to write 10 minutes. And you're going to feel great. And maybe you write four days. Or maybe you have a day where you write three minutes. And you know what? That's fine, too. But the point is, if you pick a realistic goal, then you can exceed it and feel have a higher chance of a positive outcome in terms of how you feel about it than picking a goal that you think you, quote, should do and then set yourself up for potential failure. I think it's also important to choose a time of day that works for you. I mean, I'm a morning person, so I know that the best time for me to write is like first thing in the morning before I jump on something else. When I've taken writing classes, I've tried to make it so that I get up before I have to go to work and do other things. I get up earlier and I do my writing, whatever my writing is for that day. You may be a night owl. Cool. You may say I'm going to do it at lunchtime because I'm going to take a break. And during that break, this is my break for me. So I think it's helpful to try to choose a time of day because it's almost like, you know, it's a commitment to yourself. It's part of helping to make the time frame for the commitment work. And I think it's also important to forgive yourself if you miss a day. You know, how many of us have been on diets? I know you're all raising your hand, right? And so then what happens? You eat the cookie and you're like, all right, well, today's shot, right? And then the next day you're like, well, I ate that cookie, so, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I shouldn't diet, you know. And we get to very hard on ourselves, uh, et cetera. And I think it's important to be like, okay, so I didn't write on Tuesday and I was supposed to. But you know what? Today's Wednesday. Another day, another opportunity. So I think trying to think about it in those terms will be helpful in, in getting yourself going. All right, next slide. Actually, next slide after that. <laughs> All right. Um, so I also want to talk about a few other things. Uh, actually, go back a slide, Susie. Sorry, I jumped the gun in my own brain. So I, I think there are a couple of other things I want to talk about in terms of strategies for how you're writing and when you're writing before I actually start to give you some ideas for things you might find intriguing and want to use as a way to jump in. Um, 
I typically, if, if my commitment is something like five minutes, right, I set my clock, I set a timer. I use my, uh, my phone, but I set the timer for five minutes and I do not stop my hand moving for five minutes. It's important. This is not a time to be editing. This is not a time to be judging what you've written. This is, is not a time to be holding back. This is a time to just let it flow. You know, just like when you're running, you just keep going. You run past, and you run past the point where like, oh my God, my breath is getting hard here. Maybe I should stop. And, you know, runners who want to keep going, and I'm not a runner, by the way. I've done it, but I'm not a runner. Um, but if you keep going through any physical challenge, what do you do? You work past the point of when you want to quit, right? And the thing about setting a timer is it's just like, well, I'm going till that timer stops. So I think you want to, you want to just keep your, your hand going. You want to keep your, and it, even if what you're doing is writing, and I have literally done this, um, I don't know what to say right now about this anymore. Hmm, I wonder where it's going. And it may be that, you know, you, you take whatever your initial idea was and you go off on some side tangent. That's fine. That's where you needed to go in this particular writing session, right? The key is to keep going. Um, I like to think of it, I do all my writing by typing just based on sort of what I've done for my career, but I like to think of it as my writing, my writing, my right hand, that's my dominant hand, is my writing hand and my left hand is my editor hand. And my left hand is, you know, it's, my editor hand is not working while I'm writing. While I'm writing, all I'm doing is I'm letting any thought that I want to come out to come out. And that includes don't prejudge or don't judge yourself for sort of and get out of your writing and out of where your head's going and start to say, oh, I can't say that because if I say that, you know, what if someone sees it? This is just for you. This may never see the light of day. This might be something that you burn at the end of the, t of the writing session if that's what is important to you. The key is don't judge, don't stop, don't edit. Let yourself say your scariest, your most hateful, your happiest emotions, whatever they are, whatever the thing is, okay? Just keep on going. Don't worry about, don't worry about grammar or spelling or, you know, punctuation. This is, that's editing. You're not doing that. You're writing. You're writing. And so those are some points that I, I wanted to get across to you as part of this tip. All right, Susie, next one. Thank you. Um, so this is, I'm giving you some examples here, which, you know, you're going to get these slides afterwards so you can use them. But here, I, I like to get, you know, as in with a muscle, right, when you're, I'm going to keep giving the running example, but you warm up, you either start slowly or you do some stretching or whatever. And doing writing prompts on short um, topics can be, um, it, it can be a good way to sort of just get the writing juices flowing, and it also can bring up ideas that then later you're like, huh, that's interesting. I would like to explore that further, whatever the that is. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways to, one sort of example of a writing prompt that you can use that's on this slide here is write for three minutes about how you feel without stopping. And these are just examples. You know, today I feel happy, I feel sad, I feel angry, I feel emotional, I feel depressed, I feel anxious, I feel furious, I feel, um, I mean, whatever it is, it can be anything, right? So that's a way of starting to jump in if you're like, wow, today's my writing day and I don't know where to start. We'll start with like, today I feel Pick an example and then move on. You can also do the antithesis of that, and you can sort of say, you can say, today I can, right, and then fill in the blank. Or today I can't, the antithesis. Or I, today I want, or today I don't want, right? Today I will, fill in the blank, today I won't. So you can always sort of take the opposite of some of these simple emotions and thoughts as your starting point and you can move from there and see where see where you go in in terms of, of a writing you know getting your writing going okay so that's one tip for sort of getting started it started another place is the next slide so another thing that can be fun to do for writing prompts and we'll mention this again later but we do writing prompts on our Facebook page all the time and they're open for people there 
you can also find writing prompts on, online as well. But I like the would you rather ones. They're fun. Would you rather live in fear or in debt? You have to pick one. You can't be, in, you can't be ambiguous, right? Would you rather spend the day surfing in the ocean or surfing the web? You know, so you can go back and forth on these sort of either or propositions, and that can be um, that can be a lot of fun. And also, again, you get a little nibble of something, and you're like, yeah, I'm going to come back to that. That's interesting to me. Um, an example from my writing um, around my son is schizophrenia. Um, I started to see as I was writing a lot that the idea of, you know, you have, sometimes the only way out is through, right? You've just got to put one step in front of the other and, and assume that at some point you're going to end up someplace that feels better. And I started realizing, you know, that's interesting. That's about walking. And I took a, I took the time to do a writing prompt, right? Set my timer and I literally broke down one step, each component of it, like, and that prompted me to realize, wow, there's a certain point you lift your leg, and when you have one leg up, you're only standing on one leg, right? Well, that's pretty precarious, and then you're going to put, you have to put your foot down in the exact right way with the heel, otherwise you can fall over, and the assumption of this sort of hanging one, one leg up and one, you know, leg on the ground is that the ground is going to be subtle and, um, uh, and it's going to be solid, sorry, when you reach it. And of course, it's not necessarily. And isn't that kind of a, you know, uh, an, an odd way to sort of move forward in the world? Anyway, I did this whole writing thing around one step, which then informed how I wrote about moving forward with schizophrenia. So it's just, it's an example of how you can break something down too and do what I call side writing, which all my students know. I'll tell them often, hey, why don't you go side right on that? Because it's like, take this one little piece and see where it takes you. Don't try to tie it in at that moment. Okay, next slide. So, yes, yeah, so this is just, <laughs> this is entirely because Susie wanted to get in that cat gift. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> um, but uh, let it out. Set the time. Don't edit. Don't worry. Don't. Don't say, I can't say something like that. It's too terrible. It's too evil. It's too wonderful. Just let it go and let all of the emotions um, come out. Um, uh, it's important to sort of know that ultimately no one has to see it if you don't want them to. This is entirely for you if that's what you want. All right, next slide. Yeah. <laughs> Another example is, oh yes, another cat gift. Hmm. Um, the, uh, another option is to write a letter, right? Just pick somebody and write a letter to them. It could be somebody you want to forgive. It could be somebody you're angry about. It could be something you're hurt about. You just you know, write a letter to them and say exactly what you want to say. Don't hold it back. You don't have to mail it. This is about the process. But the point is, you're sitting down and it's your day to write and you're not sure where to start start by writing a letter. And um, again, you may be surprised by some of the things that um, come up as, as options or opportunities for you to explore writing in other ways as well. Okay, next slide. All right, this is something, this is an exercise that sort of is an interesting one because one of the things that it helps you understand is how a point of view is so important when you're writing. So take an event and write a recap of it to a friend, you know, somebody who's a peer of yours. Then take the event and write it as if you're telling it to one of your parents. And then take the event and write it as if you're telling it to your boss or some person of authority. And then look at how they're different. I mean, you will see you use different language. You use different sorts of, um, you, you elaborate certain details and maybe leave other details out. You, you um, may write more formally when it's, you're writing it to your boss or a parent than you would when you're writing it to a friend, okay? But doing that as an exercise is a way to sort of see how that, the different ways that you can write and how tone and point of view can affect where you want to go with a particular piece. And this is, you know, this is for writing. I mean, it's a great exercise to do generally. Um, 
but it also is a way for if you decide that you want to take your writing and you, you've, you've jumped onto something and it's really gotten you, you know, jazzed up and you want to do something more with it and you're thinking, hey, maybe I could send this someplace. I mean, um, then thinking about who your audience is, this exercise will help you better understand that thought process. Okay, next slide. All right, we are going to now take a couple of moments to actually write. I hope you all brought pen, paper, laptop, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm just going to do this as a mini exercise, but this means there will be some dead air, if you will. But I'm only going to do it um, for one minute for each thing. I would encourage you to take it and, you know, sometime when you have more time, set a timer to do each part for maybe three to five minutes and see where it takes you. Okay, and this is what I call like what's in my toolbox. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to take um, one minute because of what we're doing here and I'd like you to write all of the things that are in your toolbox right now, all your strengths, all your positive attributes, all of your skills, you know, could be I'm a great cook or I really know how to, I really know how to run, I'm a, I'm a musician, I'm a wonderful communicator, I understand people. Whatever it is, take one minute right now to write down everything that's in your toolbox that are skills that you have that work for you. I feel like we should have the gym. <laughs> I'd sing, but you, no one wants that. All right, great. That was your first minute. Now, I want you to make another list, another section, and I want you to make a list, it's one minute starting now, of everything you wish was in your toolbox. What are the skills, the attributes, the strengths, the traits, the affirmations that you wish were in your toolbox? Make that list now, one minute. All right, great. And finally, third third part. I want you to write down three steps that you can take to move one thing that's not in your toolbox, but you want it to be over into your toolbox. Pick one of those traits that's in your not here for me yet and write down three steps that you need to take or could take to move that one thing into your toolbox. One minute.
Okay. So again, I would encourage you to, you know, do that exercise and take more time to do it um, because I think it can be useful um, and it can be something that you do re in a recurring way um, over time. Um, the other thing was we, we were going to end with um, this quote from Anne Frank, but I don't know, Susie, it's looking a little strange on my screen, but anyway. Yeah, I, can, mine too. I don't okay. know if I, I probably did that. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> I can shake everything off as I write. My sorrows disappear. My courage is reborn. Um, that's just a quote from Anne Frank, who I think we can all agree had a challenging life. Um, and uh, I just want to say that I hope that you, um, some of this has been inspirational for you and that it's encouraging to you to go ahead and try giving writing a, um, giving writing a shot in your daily life. So that's all I've got, Susie. Great. Thank you, Janet. So um, I'm sure this is me messing up the slides here, but there we go. Um, just wanted to end with uh, ways that everyone can connect with us. So I think I saw in the chat someone was looking for our Facebook group. Um, we just opened this up to the public. Um, and so if you go to Facebook, it's right on MHC. Um, so W-R-I-T-E-O-N-M-H-C. We're also on Instagram. Um, so like Janet said, there are, she posts writing prompts there and, and it's open to everyone to talk about writing, share articles about writing, share your writing, all kinds of good stuff. So we've had that as a private group, but we really want to just open it up to others to benefit from that. Um, and then if you want to connect with us directly, if anyone wants to know more about the Write-On program, about the research we've done around writing, um, there's my information and there's Janet's information. Um, obviously, Janet can speak to, um, to everything, but we are building Write-On as an evidence-based program that we're taking across the country. So if there are any other mental health professionals or others that would like to work with us on that, feel free to reach out to me. and. There are our Mental Health Connecticut uh, connections or our Mental Health CT and all the platforms. Um, just like MHA, we're going to be um, very, very active in May for Mental Health Month. Um, and actually, May 1st was supposed to be our annual fundraiser. Um, and it was going to support right on. And it was all about storytelling. Um, and writing, and so now we've shifted our entire month to be about storytelling and writing with workshops and interviews um, with writers and, and all sorts of great stuff. So be sure to check us out. We'll be posting a lot next week, getting ready for Mental Health Month. And that's all I have, Kelly. Thank you so much for hosting us and having us, and I don't know if there's a few minutes if anyone wants to ask questions or... Yeah, thank you both, Janet and Susie. That was amazing. I don't know if you were, either of you are looking at the chat box, but it is just blowing up with thanks and gratitude. Um, so oh, great. Thank you. Yeah, this was really awesome. I enjoyed those very awesome prompts, Janet. That was a good time just going through and looking at my toolbox. Um, but we do have a few minutes left. Um, I haven't seen many questions, but just wanted to open it up for the next five minutes for folks on the line. If you have any questions um, that you want to ask, one of the things that I've seen um, a few times is uh, we did record this, and the recording and the slides will be available on MHA's website. Um, we have an MHA webinars archive where you can find recordings and slides for all of our webinars. And then um, for everybody on the line and for everyone who's registered, um, this will be uh, sent to you as well. Oh, it's great to see everyone's comments here about how they're using writing and, and how they found it beneficial. So thank you, thank you everybody for sharing. Yeah, I saw one question that just sort of said writing versus typing, which I just personally is, thinks it is interesting just because um, I completely always type because, uh, well, I've been a, a journalist for, you know, a lot of years. Uh, <laughs> and um, I literally can hardly hold a pen. My whole brain is now works through my fingers onto a keyboard. Um, but I do think it's, I think it's whatever comfortable, most comfortable for you. And I do think that 
because I'm so comfortable typing, that's what feels comfortable to me. I often close my eyes when I'm writing and just type blind, you know, type with my hands because I, I can do that. And so whatever feels the best for you, if it's a pen or a pencil or whatever, you know, do it. If it's a journal, if it's online, not lying, you know, whatever it is that makes makes you comfortable, I think. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the opposite. I have to have pen and paper. I'm a very visual person, so I'm not only writing, I'm drawing pictures, and, like, I have to have that experience of the paper, the pen. Um, otherwise, it doesn't feel like I'm fully getting my thoughts out, which is... Yeah. Question. Right. Um, somebody else said... It. I'm just reading the chat. Is that okay, uh, Kelly, is in oh, terms yeah, of... Yeah, go for it. Okay. Well, some, someone asked about um, writing about traumatic events, and, and I think that um, my suggestion around that would be to um, let yourself go at the speed at which you want to go and as far as your own comfort level is, and then at the moment where you reach that, you're like, oh, I can't go there. I can't go any further. Take a moment and just sort of think, well, what if I just wrote two more sentences? And then, well, what if I wrote two more sentences? And that may be a way to sort of keep going into the part that you're, you know, is the most raw and is the part, you know, probably where some of the healing needs to happen, et cetera. Um, uh, I wrote a piece for the, a newspaper about my mother who was an alcoholic and, um, uh, who basically, you know, died through drinking herself to death. And when I, each time I wrote something about it, I would give it to, some, I think giving it to a trusted reader, reader is another way to do it. I would give it to the person who was editing it. And I'm like, is that too much? Is that too much? And he'd be like, no, no, you can keep going. And it, so it was reassuring, but he knew enough too to just sort of say, no, you need to just let it go. You can edit it backwards if you need to. But if you take the small steps, um, that's where you can really sort of gain additional benefit. Writing it at all is a benefit. The more you can write it, the better. Hmm. Hey, Janet, there's a question here in the chat about suggestions for younger writers, like elementary school age. Well, as, you, as I mentioned initially, you know, I got my first diary when I was t t in second grade um, um, in a gift from my parents, which was shocking, actually, when I think back on it from them. <laughs> At any rate, um, because they also only gave me, like, two books my entire life. But anyway, um, so I think encouraging people to um, t tell their story, but also, you know, in this time, um, you know, just saying, hey, we're going to, we're, gonna, we're all going to keep journals. Let's just keep journals so we can look back at this later, you know, if we want to. And I think there's a way to sort of uh, use that as a jumping off point to get people starting to be involved in writing. And um, I think kids, when kids also um, see parents, the adults in their lives writing, that also gets, makes them curious. Um, and coming up with activities where you are telling each other stories can be, you know, you can do it orally, like around the dinner table, play some storytelling games, um, you know, start a sentence and then somebody else has to keep the sentence going and then the next person keeps the sentence going. I guess my point is, you know, building a love around words helps to generate um, an interest and enthusiasm, you know, for, for, younger, for younger writers. You can also take the like that the prompt I had. I feel, I can, I will, I won't. I mean, those are always good ones. Oh yeah, 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 absolutely. Cool, um, Kelly. Will we? Is there a way to capture all these like questions and comments in the chat? Um, I will try to figure that out. <laughs> but actually, you're, uh, this is actually something I'm thinking about this week um, because there are many of them. So I will um, try to figure that out so I can get them to you all. Um, okay. Or at least some of the uh, the questions and comments. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you all are done, I can, um, I know we have a bunch of folks who've asked some questions, but we are at time. And um, I know Susie and Janet both provided their contact information. If you all want to, uh, to follow up directly with your questions or about participating in the awesome, awesome stuff they have at MHC going on next month um, or any of the 
you know, ongoing groups that they're doing. Um, wanted to take this time to again thank you, Susie and Janet, for an awesome webinar and just sharing really the cool stuff that you're doing. And to thank all the attendees um, for your participation um, on this webinar and for you know for folks who've been attending our webinars, it's been really great to hear from everybody. Um, and just a reminder, the recording and slides will be sent out um, early next week. They'll be emailed to you if you registered for the webinar, um, but it'll, they'll also be available on MHA's um, webinar archive page. And with that, um, I'll thank you all for your time. And um, you can reach out to me directly, too, if you have any MHA-related questions. But otherwise, hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kelly. Thanks, MHA. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care.